This conference will now be recorded. All right, it's six o'clock. This meeting of the Rome City Council will now come to order. It's Thursday, August 25th, 2022. Um, all right. And we do have a quorum. I understand Patrick is going to be late this evening. Had something with his daughter. Um, all right, let's start out with our invocation. That'll be Pastor Jeremy. And he's from the Waypoint Waypoint Church out on BC out on BC Rim. Thank you, Mayor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We humbly come before you today with thanksgiving in our hearts. We we thank you for this opportunity to gather today uh, as leaders and, and community members, Lord Jesus, for this wonderful community that you have blessed us with. We thank you for all these representatives and leaders who serve this community, Father, for the best interest of your people, Lord. We thank you for the mayor. We thank you for the city council that you have blessed us with, and we pray wisdom we pray safety. We pray health over them, Lord Jesus. For you instructed us to pray over our leaders, for they need it evermore, Lord Jesus, in times of help. So we pray blessings over them. We pray blessings over this city. We pray for those who serve this city in capacities such as teachers and, and police officers, firefighters. God, we pray a hand of protection over them, Lord Jesus. God, we pray for the people of this city, the inhabitants, Lord Jesus, those who, who live here day in and day out, God, that you will continue to bless us and allow us to thrive in unity and love and peace, Father. We thank you for this time, and, and we just pray that you will give us complete direction and wisdom over everything that is brought up in an agenda, God. Give us that direction. Give us that wisdom so that we can make the best decisions for the city of Rome. We thank you for that. In your name, amen. Amen. One state of the one public comments. The council is not permitted to take action on or discuss any comments made to the council at this time concerning an item not listed on the agenda. However, a council member or mayor may make a statement of fact regarding the item, make a statement concerning the policy regarding the item, or may propose that the item be placed on a future agenda or direct the city administrator to, con to contact the individual to address. If you are attending the meeting via live streaming and you would like to make a public comment, you must email the city secretary at citysecretary at cityofrome.com prior to 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting and must identify each subject you plan to present to be recognized. If the writer of a public comment wants someone to read the letter, it will only be read by the city secretary and must be emailed prior to 4 p.m. on the day of the meeting. Public comments made in person require the speaker to submit the sign-up form to the city secretary prior to the meeting, and the form must identify each subject the speaker plans to present. A statement of no more than three minutes may be made. There will be no yielding of time to another person. Comments should be directed to the entire council, not individual members. Engaging in verbal attacks or comments intended to insult, abuse, malign, or slander any individuals shall be cause for termination of time privileges and removal from council chambers. Okay, and Ms. Shana, I believe it's yours. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Mayor. Um, up first, we have Lisa Ann Wilson's letter. Says, Rome, budget time is upon us. Let's do our due, dil due diligence to go line by line to cut the fat out of each 
department head and the interim city administrator to consider needs versus wants. With our economy in such bad shape and inflation on the rise and our city in such enormous debt, we must do our best to look out for our citizens' pocketbooks. The city needs to be more conservative and quit throwing money around like it's confetti on New Year's Eve. In my opinion, there seems to be a double standard in some, but not all, of our governing body. A few months ago, they decided to limit the information presented to council to ensure hateful or insulting statements could not be presented. Along these same lines, they also passed an ordinance, code of conduct, which applied to their own behavior. In my opinion, they are trying to censor our First Amendment rights. However, even though there is still a code of conduct in place, it appears there is a double standard and they proceed to charge erroneous comments about former and current governing body during council meetings. Stop trying to place blame on others to simply further your political career. Citizens were outed in the local county newspaper. Rome citizens were chastised and scolded and called hostile instigators and asked to participate in a 90-day cool-off period from commenting on social media on comments and questions. This letter was signed by a current council person. Seriously. We are now in trouble for simply wanting honesty and transparency from our governing body. Is this an effort to squelch us and to disregard the First Amendment? I, in my opinion, it is shameful how some, not all, of our city leaders do not follow the laws of the state. Honor your oath and do what you were sworn in to do. Not break the law with invalid contracts and move to limit the power of your mayor. Citizens are flaming mad. We will not be silenced. We will continue to pay attention to everything and not allow improper actions to occur. No more will we sit in the dark, but are awake and alert and will continue to watch every move with watchful eyes. My hometown of 56 years has always been about neighbors helping neighbors, looking out for one another and doing what is best for our community, not trying to one up each other in the political arena. I pray that our city of Rome can one day get back to that experience. Lisa Ann Wilson, 240 West 1st Street. The next one is from Ashley Majors. It says, good evening council. After reviewing the agenda and multiple videos, minutes and comments, the contract should be null and void. The council did not come out and vote on 728. How did the council and citizens know that Mayor Pro Tem was about to make a drastic decision for the future of Rome? Did anyone analyze the odds or look past the friendship before writing a check? As to our attorney for review, I know you work for the city and not for the employees. Did you on this day? As you see before you, Title V Open Government Chapter 551.102 Requirements. Final action, decision, or vote on a matter deliberated in close meeting under this chapter may only be made in an open meeting that is held in compliance with the notice provisions of this chapter. I'm asking for a change. There was only one person in mind when the decision was made and not the city of our size and the debt we would hold. Now on to the half million debt for our employees' resignations. Please go into detail. The previous secretary was not doing her job, and I have plenty of emails from your previous city administrator that our bank reconciliations were months and months behind. I would ask you how we would know what it is, what is in our bank. Then she hired Ms. Davenport, and she could not do the job either. Your previous city administrator could not teach her. <clears throat> now we have an exceptional employee working for us. Again, go into detail. The letter are before you. Just remember the council was forbidden to speak to an employee. Council, have you asked your city employees what they would like in their next department head? It might be a good chance that taking the word from an employee who was not doing their job. As a citizen, I would like to see a city administrator who can bring a business in, work on our comprehensive plan, or just as small as having events with the citizens of Rome. Ashley Majors. Next we have Shirley Mai.
Shirley, if you're on, can you unmute yourself? We'll give her some time to figure it out. Uh, next, we have Deborah Beecraft. I'm Deborah Beecraft. I live at 360 West 2nd. State law 22037C, Mayor Pro Tem shall assume the duties of the mayor when the mayor is not available, fails, or refuses, or is unable to act. A council person has no power outside a council meeting, as this council was fond of telling councilwoman woman majors. TML, the most prudent course for a council member is to refrain from taking action or otherwise becoming involved in any supervisory role with respect to individual city employees. Proceed as part of properly convened city council meeting and not as an individual. Ordinance 1.03.002. At all times, the mayor shall have the powers and duties of the local government code 22042. Local government code 22037, 22042, and 23027. A mayor's duties and authority come first from local government and state law and then may be expanded by the City Council. 104007, the Mayor shall sign all legal documents. 107010, no officer shall enter into a contract for labor or services for a period of 12 months after terminating their office with the City, City Administrator and Public Works. 106001 and 002 and Local Government Code 22010. The mayor shall appoint to vacancy with approval of council any vacancy of municipal officers, which are the city secretary, attorney, and the admin. 106032, city admin, under direct supervision of the mayor, shall exercise duties as delegated by the mayor. 103004, items for agenda presented to the mayor and the secretary at least one working day prior to the posting deadline. 103009, a council member being appointed to an office that they lost the election for violates number one, in my opinion. And number four of this ordinance violates 103002, 106032, 106002, and state government codes 22042B and 22010E. Local government code 418. 1015, the mayor is the emergency management officer for the city. Local government code 22039, Open Meetings Act, violated July 28th by making a decision in executive session, taking no action in open meeting. The ex-city administrator acted in violation of many of our codes and our council supported her. The three council people that have been in office for one to five years have habitually violated state law, local government code, and city ordinances by not doing their due diligence. The city attorney has allowed this to happen by not giving council proper guidance. People on social media are calling for your resignations, a forensic audit, and a new city attorney. This is also my personal opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Baker. Next, we have Joanne Wilson. Yes, I am Joanne Wilson, 240 West 1st, Mayor and Council. I kind of hated to follow Deborah's report. She had so much information in detail. I am not going to go into detail about the illegal contracts that were put in place for the administrator and interim administrator when the administrator resigned from the city and had a contract that explained how that would be hand handled. Also, appointing the mayor pro tem to assume the mayor's duty was also illegal in violation of state statutes, as you've just heard. 
as provided in state statutes, the mayor pro tem assumes the duties of the mayor in event the mayor is not available. In this instance, she was available. I believe you will do the right thing and declare these illegal contracts null and void. This is not a breach of a contract in as much as the contracts were illegal to begin with. If you choose not to declare these contracts null and void, then I believe, as the citizens have asked, you should put your resignation in tonight. We citizens trusted you to follow all laws and your oath, both local and state. Do not continue to be an embarrassment to our city. We need to move on and head our city in the right direction. Lately, we have been inundated with many unpermitted solicitors, some very pushy and intimidating. We all need to let the police know about these in a timely manner. Let's protect our citizens. Sure, our facilities do need to be upgraded. However, can we start anew and not depend on outdated numbers and carefully assure we take into consideration local cost and not the use of a national average. Be good stewards of our citizens' tax dollar. Lastly, budget time is upon us, and please assure that state statutes are followed in preparation of our budget. It is very important that that happens. Be frugal, but follow the law in putting a budget together. Again, I think it's probably the time for a forensic audit because we've had so much turnover and so much confusion lately. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Wilson. I'd like to make a point of correction. Mr. Atkins, have we done anything illegal or immoral or improper? Talking to the mic. No, council member, not that I have observed. Shirley Mize, are you online? We'll come back one more time at the end, just in case. Uh, next we have Donna DeGarmo. I'm Donna DeGarmo from 104 Kensington here in Rome. And to begin with, I want to comment, thank God we have all these police because all these ladies up front think you are all breaking all the laws in our state and county. And okay. that maybe I don't know, I don't know. You know what, what? we don't attack, all right? <sighs> Well, but I'm just, I'm just really hey, glad that they're there. You know what? <laughs> if, if I didn't say it, McCabe would. <laughs> and I was going to say, and um, I thought I was being, and one of the things I want to say is free speech. We all have free speech. But one of the um, comments that the mayor, past mayor made was embarrassment. I have read The Messenger and I have watched our last meeting and there is nothing but embarrassment from council and or attendance because and I can't say any names or anything like that but it was very embarrassing I as a person looking at this was embarrassed for my town it was you know hostile it was pathetic so I would wish that all attendees and council could be a little bit more professional and I would also say that some of the looks and actions from our council were very, very unprofessional, very unprofessional. I do enjoy the fact that some of us are now looking more of a part of a, a good city and things like that with the suits and the, the better clothes and that, but uh, 
we have, I have watched the last meeting, which showed us kind of laying back in our feet, being really aggravated that was what was being said. And it was like, not a good look at all for us. So anyhow, those are my um, main comments. I think that our town, if we're going to go in the right direction, needs all the council members we have at the moment. Heaven help us if any of them leave. And I think they are professional. I think they have the best hopes and dreams for our city in their actions. And um, I can't say any more than that. I think our I think our attorney has sat here and said over and over again that we are not breaking any laws. And um, I don't have a law degree, but I tend to believe him. So that might okay. be my three minutes. I'm out of here. Thank you. Next, we have Richard Dean. My name is Richard Dean of 315 Oak Court, Rome, Texas. I got a full-time job in uh, New Fairview, and I just ran from there to town. I cut through on uh, Pioneer and Zion and come out on Hickory, and I noticed there's lots of trash on the sides of the road. I talked to the former... Uh, city administrator and said didn't have a community service program so if that's something Rome would like to start I got a lot of experience in that and uh, could supervise it that's all I got to say thank you thank you Shirley Mize are you online Mayor, that's the last one I have. Thank you. Uh, announcements from Mayor and Council members. September 5th, uh, 2022, City Hall will be closed for Labor Day. September the 6th, that will be the next bulk trash pickup. City Council meeting, September 8th, 2022, at 6 p.m. And Planning and Zoning meeting, September 12th, 2022, at 6 p.m. Do we have any others? I do, Mayor. Uh, Chief Devis, I'll probably need your help on this one. Um, but for everybody that's either aware or not aware of the full story, uh, the first week our chief of police started, there was a officer involved chase and shooting uh, where one officer was actually hit. Uh, that case says went to court and it's finally been settled last week. Um, so, Chief, if you could give a brief synopsis of what happened and the outcome, I just want to let everybody know that justice was served uh, and one of our officers is safe and back to work. So, uh, thank you to the judicial system for that and our officers for keeping this down safe. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, yes, uh, I'm going to start with saying thank God we're in Wise County. Uh, if you don't know, you have a, an incredible district attorney's office that stands behind the men in blue and the women in blue of this county. Um, we're lucky to be here. It was just a little over a year ago, about a week after I was hired, that uh, a Sergeant Rex, Rex Ritchie was shot in the line of duty. He's back there, wave, so, Sergeant, there he is. And uh, he recovered from his injuries. The guy was caught about two weeks later in Mountain View, Arkansas, brought back to justice here in Wise County, and was given a life plus 60 years. Uh, so he will not be back on the street. And we owe it to the fine folks of the Wise County Sheriff's Office that helped conduct the investigation. They were assisted by Texas Ranger B.J. Hill. Shout out to him. And again, the, uh, the actions by our officers that uh, contributed to their saving their lives and uh, bringing the bad guy to justice. So thank you, Mayor. Pro Tem. Anything else? All right. Consent agenda. Um, all items under the section are recommended for approval for the consent agenda. 
routine nature require only brief deliberation by council. Council reserves the right to remove any item on the consent agenda for further deliberation. Um, A, minutes of city council regular session dated August 11th. The minutes of regular planning and zoning meeting dated July 11th, 2022. And then, of course, we've got the swearing in of a new police officer, um, Juan Munoz. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda. Okay. Second. Who second? Kathy does. All Very right. good. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Um, I am your chief of police, acting interim city administrator, so I'm not wearing my uniform like I normally am for this occasion. We're going to bring up the entire team that's here because when you join the own police department, you're not joining the department, you're joining a police team. And uh, we all, we are, every success and every failure is distributed across the entire team. None of us work individually. So tonight we're here to introduce Juan Munoz, who has his family here. And I want him to go ahead and just, before I get to you, I want you to say a few words about your family and who you got here tonight. For that. Okay. I didn't think so. <laughs> uh, first of all, I have my aunt, my uncle, Vicente Flores, and Tina, my cousin Lisa, and her husband Max, my cousin Renee, and her husband Will. And I got my brother in law, Armando, and his girlfriend, my mother in law, Anita, my stepkids, Max and Monica, and my girlfriend, Andalia Step. He's not going to tell you, but Adalia is why he's here. So it wasn't, <laughs> we're not, it's, it's partly Rome, but it's partly, it's mostly her. So um, we're going to go ahead and swear one in. One of the, one of the unique things about this, this now makes the Rome Police Department trilingual. Um, obviously we speak English, but we also have an officer that speaks French. And now we have an officer that speaks fluent Spanish. So we're getting there, we're diversifying, and it's a, it's a tribute to our city and uh, the future that it holds for us. So I'm going to ask you, officer, to raise your right hand. In the name and by the authority of the state of Texas, repeat after me. I, state your name. I, Juan Munoz. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear and affirm. That I will faithfully execute the duties. That I will faithfully execute the duties. Of the office of the city of Rome police officer. Of the office of the city police officer of Rome, of the state of Texas, of the state of Texas, and I will to the best of my ability, and preserve, I, and I will to the best of my abilities and preserve, protect, protect, and defend, and defend the Constitution, the Constitution, and the laws of the United States, and the laws of the United States, and of this state, and of this state. So help me God. To help me God. Fantastic. Welcome aboard. <laughs> I'm going to put him on the spot here and have him pick one of these family members to come up and pin his badge on. So welcome to Officer Juan Munoz to the Rome Police Department. Move on to our public hearing. Um, D, Rome City Council to conduct public hearing to hear citizen input regarding the proposed budget for fiscal year October 1, uh, 2022 to September 30th, 2023. Um, you know what, out of respect for um, one of our attendees this evening, uh, I'm going to move E up so we can go ahead and look at that. 
before we get into the budget. Um, Rome City Council to conduct a public hearing on Monday, August 22nd, and the City of Rome City Council hold a public hearing on Thursday, August 25, 2022, for the purpose of hearing comments regarding a text amendment to the City of Rome Zoning Code that will amend the sections to create the uses of brewery and small event venue, defining said uses and permitting said uses within the C Commercial Zoning District and to define the use to tourist home, bed and breakfast, providing a cumulative cause, providing a severability clause, providing a penalty clause, providing a savings clause, providing a publication clause, and providing for an effective date. Okay, we'll open a public hearing at 631. Do I hear any comments? Yes, ma'am. I need to say who I am again. Yeah. Deborah B. Craft, 360 West 2nd. I think these businesses would be a blessing to Rome. It will bring in tourists or even just people for the evening. And the more people we get to come here to utilize our businesses, the more other businesses will want to be here. So I think it's a step in the right direction for growth for the city. Thank you. Very good. Anyone else? Yes, please, Judge Walker. I'm Brian Walker, and I own uh, 311 Old Mill Road, which is also known as the Old Mill. Uh, I just I would be obviously our property would be directly affected by this potential amendment. We're in favor of it. I'm in favor of it. Um, a little bit of background, a lot of you know this, but I figured it helps to have everybody kind of have the idea. Um, I purchased the, the old mill uh, a few months ago. Since then, been doing some cleanup work, spent twenty to twenty-five to $30,000 already on tree work, cleaning out. There was a lot of junk throughout the property, tearing down some structures um, with the plans and hopes of having a multi-use uh, development there as the owner of the developer and the landlord. Uh, one of the, there's multiple uses that I envision and hope to have. Uh, the first one is is a, a brewery will be the primary tenant. Um, and, and then I'll get back to that. Then the second piece would be the potential of maybe renovating the silos into short-term rental units, uh, Airbnb type units, so that uh, uh, people who maybe visit the brewery could stay on site. Um, but also would go hand in hand with the third purpose, which would be an event center and possibly having weddings on site. The, the very top floor of the old mill, once it's renovated, will be really perfect um, for, for medium size, smaller to medium size weddings. And so uh, the short term rental pieces and the silos could potentially be a place for his and hers green rooms, bridal uh, preparation areas, things like that, so that they can get ready uh, for their weddings and potentially maybe even stay overnight after getting married there. And so, and then the fourth piece would be uh, the old mill itself, the old building, the, the, the main part that you see up front uh, that was built in 1883, uh, the hopes there would be to just leave that is on the first floor, kind of a tasting room area, potential restaurant space, second floor would be overflow seating, and then the third floor would be more of that event space, uh, hopefully. Um, and then, uh, uh, there's possibilities. Some, we've talked about possibly having a coffee shop in that little garage area in the back. If you've noticed, uh, the old storage units that were back there have been taken down. They've been raised. Uh, the plans are to make that be the parking lot in the very back. Uh, the brewery itself will be in the back. Um, there's an old two-bedroom, two-bath house. We hope to tear it down, ultimately build a new 5,000-square-foot uh, metal building there where the actual brewery would be. Um, and then the old long building that's already in the back, I believe they would they would use that for office space for the brewery and storage, dry storage, things of that, that, that nature. So everything you see from the street would basically be kind of your retail frontage, uh, uh, restaurant tasting room type things. Um, and uh, and that's the plan. Uh, as far as the brewery piece goes, uh, 
Peter Betcher's here in the back. You can wave your hand, Peter. Peter is, uh, if, if he joined the police department, he would be a, a fourth language because he's from Germany originally. He's been in the United States for about 30 years. Uh, been doing brewing since. Uh, before he came, he grew up in southwest Germany. Uh, was uh, Went to a brewing, probably the top brewing school in Munich in Bavaria. Uh, got a four-year degree there. Came to the United States, ran some breweries. Uh, ultimately, he was one of the early founding brewmasters at, at Abita Brewery in Louisiana, if you've heard of that. Um, he was uh, at Miller Course Fort Worth, was their, their top technical brewer there for, uh, for many, many years. And then in the past several years, he's been a consultant. He consults with breweries all around the world. Um, and he's going to come on board and, and, and be the, the front man of this brewery and, and, uh, and run the brewery, be uh, one of the owners. Um, and uh, he, oh, yes, in addition to being a consultant, several times he's been asked to come on as a contractor to run some breweries as head brewmaster. And Allstott Brewery in Fredericksburg was, I think, founded in 2018. He was their founding brewmaster. They're already the fourth largest independent brewery in the state of Texas. And so he has a lot of experience uh, taking breweries from nothing and turning them into fully functioning, successful enterprises. Uh, he's probably, I think, the only person in all of North Texas who is a professor of brewing science at a, at a college in, in, in North Texas. So he knows what he's doing. And, and so it would be a, a real good positive, I think, for uh, not just uh, my plans as the landlord and developer of that property, but also for the city of Rome. And of course, it would be professional. It's not going to bring in riffraff. People who drink craft beer, uh, the, the top demographic for that is actually typically college-educated individuals who are the, between the ages of 35 and 55 who have families. That's, that's kind of the, the direct consumer. Uh, that's uh, according to studies, um, some things that Peter gave me that I've read. Um, and so it doesn't bring in the types of people that, that might be prone to criminality, if that makes sense. And if you're not familiar with it, visit some of the breweries in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and you'll get the idea. Um, that's all I have. Please vote for it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Judge Walker. All right. Any other comments? All right. We'll close the public hearing at 637. I hear a motion to approve the uh, amended ordinance. We're not there yet. Okay. All right. Just a public hearing. All right. Thank you. So what? Let's while we're on it, let's just go to it. That would be J. Then we'll vote on J. Let me. Uh, can I make a statement real quick? Yes. So. There was a slight change to it. It made it a little more restrictive. Um, so what staff is asking is uh, and our planning and zoning commissioner recommending the council authorize the text amendment to the zoning code that creates the use of brewery and small event venue via a specific use permit within the C commercial zoning district and to define the use tourist home bed and breakfast. The caveat there, the difference was adding via a specific use permit. It allowed the city to maintain a little bit tighter control on what is allowed in that zoning district. So are we still amending the ordinance? Is no, ma'am, we're looking amendment? for a vote. Uh, and we're recommending that it is approved. Um, I understand that, but our it says regarding a text text amendment yes. to the zoning code. Yes. We're still doing that. Yes, ma'am. Okay, that's what I was trying to clarify. Yes, ma'am, my apologies. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll hear a vote or a motion. I still move. I second that. Sorry. Priest and Kennedy. Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Judge Walker, welcome. Welcome to the neighborhood. <laughs> okay. Um, let's go on down to the, the next one with the plats, and then we'll come back to the budget, because there's a couple of other things down here that are also related to the budget. These are done right here. Okay. Rome City Council to conduct a public hearing to consider replant by the city of Rome, Texas of two tracts of land, one tract being legally described as acres 3.600 
abstract A-634-MEP and PRR and is located on the southeast corner of U.S. Highway 287 Northbound Service Road and B.C. Rome on one tract of land being legally described as Acres 1.253, Lot 1, Block 1, Subdivision Taco Casa Rome Edition, Abstract A-634-MEP and PRR, just west of Taco Casa, located at 201 School Road, Rome, Texas, 76078. We'll open the public hearing at 640. Yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm for it. But there is a clerical error. I'm assuming it was just an accident. On page 84 and 94 of the council packet, on the QT stuff, you have 3.600 acres plus 1.253 acres. But on their map, they have it as 4.854 acres. The math in there, it should be 4.853 acres. So I don't know if that makes a difference in anything legal on down the road or not. So I just want y'all to be aware of it. Thank you. Does it matter? What's on the agenda is correct. Close the public hearing at 642. Okay, discussion, any necessary action? regarding a replant by the City of Rome, Texas of two tracts of land, one tract being legally described as Acres 3.600, Abstract A-634-MEP and PRR, and is located on the southeast corner of U.S. Highway 287, Northbound Service Road, and B.C. Rome, and one tract of land being legally described as Acres 1.253, Lot 1, Block 1, Subdivision Taco Casa Rome Edition Abstract A 634 MEP and PRR just west of Taco Casa, located at 201 School Road, Rome, Texas 76078. Staff and the Planning and Zoning Commission are recommending approval of the replat of this property. Motions? Motion to approve. Second. All in favor? Aye. All right. Then we'll go to D, Rome City Council to conduct public hearing to hear citizen input regarding the proposed budget for fiscal year October 1, 2022 to September 30th, 2023. We'll open the public hearing at 644. Go. Okay, I have several questions. Under uh, admin, and I believe that's on the second page, for lease payments, it went from 14000 last year, it's going to 32000 and It says a one-year lease at 10% increase. But if we pay for two years, so is the thirty-two thousand two years or one year? So that would that would be my question: is what that amount is for? Because it doesn't specify. Also under there, the bond interest expense on the twenty sixteen refunding bond, it has the interest rate the interest expense going from 30 down to 23 to 17 that's 
you know, a good thing because our interest is, we're getting it paid off. But it has the principal going up. How, how is that possible? The, the interest we owe them has went down, but the principal we owe them has went from $200,089 to $300,002, according to this paperwork. And then contract labor has went from 10,000 to 122,000. I can see things going up, but that may be a little extreme. On the next page, for legal fees, last year we budgeted 96. We're almost at 200,000 for this year. Uh, for the coming year, we have 99,000 budgeted and Maybe that's not enough, considering the way the, the attorney fees go. So that might be something y'all want to look at. <clears throat> and total revenue in the building department is down 30000 And our engineering fees, we were at 50000 budgeted for this current year, and I believe we're over budget. And we only budgeted 50000 again for next year. So that's another area of concern because we shouldn't keep going over what we budget for. On the police equipment, we went from 87500 this year and we dropped it down to 4000 for next for this coming year. That seems a little extreme because I think they might need more than the 4000 just my opinion. Uh, we didn't lease any vehicles for the police, according to this. It went from 40,000 in 2020 to 2021. And for 2021, 2022, there was nothing. And then this coming year, we're going to do 50,000. Same with building maintenance, 12,000 on the gate, or, or 10,000 on the gate and only 2,000 for the rest of the building. It might be more prudent to have a little more money in there for the rest of the building, even if it's just five or $6,000 so they can do more. I'm assuming that in the fire department, the development fund is the $80,000 that's never been in the budget before is rolling B money for that fire department person that the rolling bee contracted for. Um, am I actually timed on the public hearing? Oh, well. Okay. Jana, can you try to see if Mrs. Mice, I know I had talked to her yesterday about, she had a couple of things that she wanted to talk about on the budget and see if we can get her by chance. Mrs. Mice, are you still online? Hmm. Um, I had said something a meeting or so ago about the uh, about doing the budget, and I am concerned, and I'm new at this, I'll be the first to admit, I'm new at this, but I do know by state statute, the mayor is the budget officer, which makes me accountable and ultimately responsible for the way the budget is handled. Um, according to state statute, it would, it appears to me that our budget, the way that the format is written, drawn out, that it is incomplete. State statute says the budget officer shall itemize the budget to allow as clear a comparison as practicable between expenditures included in the proposed budget and actual expenditures for the same or similar purposes made for the preceding year. The budget must show as definitively as possible each of the projects for which expenditures are set up in the budget and the estimated amount of money carried in the budget for each project. And I had inquired about that, about adding in, it shows, you know, the budget, it shows what we had last year, what our proposed budget was, and from the year before, what the proposed budget was. But 
we don't it doesn't seem to have any actuals that seems to be required by state statute and it's also in our ordinance 1.10043 the other thing i'm concerned about is the outstanding obligations of the municipality um i think on here it does show our, our total debt obligations, I believe, at $343,000, $957. I believe that's actually what our installment is this year. It's not the total amount of what uh, what the city actually owes. And I, I'm gathering that that's what is required as far as state statute goes. And then I'm also looking at um, item two on this. This is under 102.003 the cash on hand to the credit of each fund where it, it seems to me that on the the way the format of the this format it should say somewhere what we've got left over from last year that's how i am reading this statute and um then also three the funds received from all sources during the pre preceding year and these basically show the proposed budget but I'm not sure that we're showing actuals in what we actually got last year. I just want to do this right and, and you know, how it's been done in the past. I'm not sure that that is technically how we're, the, the format itself, because, you know, uh, interim city administrator, he did, he was kind enough to send out some um, oh some numbers as to what was being spent, what has been spent. However, you know, trying to match those up individually, you're talking a number of pages, and um, you know, somehow or another, though, we need to give the public when they look at this and say, well, this is what they spent last year. So this is what you know, this is what we've got left over, and this is what we propose to spend this year. Is this not correct, Mr. Atkins? Make sure he's got the microphone. Okay. All right. Hmm. Okay. Anybody else want to add anything? I think that would be helpful. Comparisons. Comparisons. That's kind of what I was getting at. You know, and like I said, you were gracious enough to forward those those other numbers to me, and I appreciate that. Um, but I think it'd be very helpful if we had it all on the same sheet, where people could just take a look at it and um, be able to do that. Public hearing, yes, ma'am. So, should we be saying anything at this point? It's part of the public hearing. We have to go to the, to the uh, Carbon, is our discussion not in the uh, future or the agenda item, not public hearing? No, actually, you need to close the public hearing, and then the council and the mayor can discuss the budget. Next do I have to say everything that I just got through saying? No, no ma'am, I don't think that would be necessary, but you do need to close the public hearing. Okay. She's online. Let's talk to Shirley Mice before we close it up. Shirley, can you unmute yourself, please? You texting? Thank you.
just texting her. Well, Shirley's talking, but she's not coming through. I don't pull up that other uh, menu, but you know, when you clicked on it, it gave you a menu underneath. The red, what does the red signify? Yeah. Are we muting them or are they muting themselves? click on that red where it says keep muted would that help I don't know it's your system and here's caller five down at the bottom too Okay. Thank you so much. Um, this is Shirley Mize. I live at 170 Russell Street. Um, I had asked to uh, have a flyer passed out to the council concerning the city of Rome salaries. I got that from govsalaries.com. And it states that the highest salary at the Rome or at the city of Rome in year of 2021 was 105, six, $105,600 number of employees at the city of Rome 
in year of 2021 was 16. Average an- annual salary was 56,159, and the media salary was 52,623. City of Rome averages a salary is 20 percent higher than the USA average, and media salary is 21 percent higher than the USA media. I wanted to share that with you because they state that we're not up to date as paying our professionals the salary that they should be paid, but they need to consider that we are a small rural uh, city. Um, Our uh, population is not very large, as we all know, and we don't have the um, housetops to uh, accommodate um, like Houston or Dallas or Fort Worth. Um, And then I had some questions on the budget itself. Uh, On administration, I don't think that we should do two years of rent uh, on the um, city hall uh, to save uh, $3,000. You'll be spending uh, approximately $11,000 to to accommodate um, the savings of three. I don't think that's justifiable. also, um, on the bond principle, I noticed that it went up instead of going down. I think that's questionable. We need to look at that and see why that number is higher. Uh, I think if you're making payments, that should be depleting. Um, we also, on um, our legal fees needs to be looked at. I think that we're not in line with what we're actually doing. But I think that um, if we adjust the way that we do things with our legal end of it, I think that if we made a list weekly and then made an email to him, we would save uh, some resource time and money on that and also only have him attend one meeting a month uh, to accommodate some of the savings. Also, um, when we have interest, or not interest, but insurance, um, I noticed that a lot of times that they're assuming um, 12% increase. I think that we know we're having a budget every year. We should also be able to go out and get quotes on that, um, on our insurance um, for our employees. Yes, you're telling me I'm up. Yes. Uh, well, I have a lot more questions, and I'll send them in an email to everybody, uh, address them, and ask them. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Mrs. Noyce. All right, 704. We'll close public. I'm sorry, is there any more comments? All right, we'll close the public hearing. All right, did you have something to say, Mrs. Priest? What, I think that um, when I was looking this over and I had some help looking at it with a, you know, uh, somebody that had a clear eye and uh, not used to looking at it, some of the comments or explanations of what those uh, expenditures that are being proposed, as well as a comparison to the year before, some of those weren't probably need to be updated so there's there's under those comments I think that, that we need to look at some clarification on those okay. and I, and I just had one other uh, one other question that occurred to me so on the code officer it's not showing up on the administrative side I think it it, it is on the police portion of the budget is that correct No, the code officer is under building and development. But isn't that a police function or did I miss something? No, it was always under building and development and it was handled by public works. But when their employee left, uh, I was approached by the city administrator as the police chief and asked if we would take on those duties uh, part time or, or um until they could hire a new code enforcement officer uh the 
direction from the council was they don't want us to have a code enforcement officer. So I was told that we would continue to do that uh, through this next year or until we change our minds about the importance of that position. Does that, that make sense? Be, yeah. Does that not need to be switched over then to police rather than building development? We absorbed it, but only temporarily. We're hoping that it, it goes back to where it needs to be. Asking, a, asking an officer to split his time from protecting the citizens of Rome and then also go out and do code enforcement is taking him away from his duties that he was hired to do. But we're happy to do it temporarily. We just don't see it as a long-term fix. Well, I would ask, I think um, we're going to have a public hearing that's got to be published for September the 8th. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Okay. If we can have updated information as to the, um, do you want to discuss with the, uh, I know it's, we have off the wall legal fees, but uh, I don't see that we've got many, much choice. Um, discuss with the city attorney as far as the state statute, what's required in the budget. And because um, that was my concern. This is my first round at, at doing the budget. But I am interested in, in, you know, complying with our state law and as well as our ordinance that specifies these particular things have to be um, on the budget. And uh, then also in uh, regard to the, um, this, I don't know, what I've got doesn't show what the tax, the actual tax rate that we're going to be looking at. But I understood it was 0.43. Is, that's a different item. Do you want to stay on this first and then move to that one? Okay. We can go to a different item on that then. So as, as, as far as the budget goes, where it says, G discussion and necessary action regarding the proposed budget, um, that's under old business. We've been working on this budget uh, through workshops, meetings, direction from council, direction from mayor, uh, I believe since March. Um, it might have gone on since before then. Stepping into this role, uh, I do know that we have done the budget the same way for the last couple of years that our former city administrator was here. And knowing her as I do, I'm sure that we followed the correct rules and procedures. But if I can get that information from you, I will absolutely consult with our legal attorney and, and see, and to just, to just to allay those concerns that you have. Um, but I will say we've been, like I said, we've been working on this for a long time. And it's, it's the end now. We, we need to make some decisions. So for that for that actual item, okay. uh, I don't that's going to be G. I don't have a sticky note or anything, but let um, me give you this reference. It's under local government code. Could, could I just get a copy of that? Do we have a copier here? Uh, if you bring it by City Hall, I can make a copy. Um, what staff is asking for is final approval of this budget submitted for 2022-2023 and a record vote. It's what's I'm sorry, and it'll be finally approved at our next council meeting. I would, but we do need a record vote tonight. I would prefer to see it updated, and, and you know, if this if this does not not apply, then we need to know that this does not apply before we take any kind of a vote on it. I would think that's not going to change the amount of the tax rate, correct? The tax rate's a different issue. That's a different. We're talking strictly budget. Oh, budget. Doing the budget itself. And what's what's required. I mean, I'm just looking at the statute. Somebody's dinging. Okay. Is it possible to table this item until we do have the public hearing September 8th? No, ma'am. I need a record vote tonight. We can change the vote on September 8th, but I have to have a record vote tonight. What do you mean specifically by record vote? Everybody needs to vote individually. Okay. I make a motion to approve the budget. I'll second. All in favor? No. Okay. McCabe? Aye. Ty? Aye. Priest? 
Aye. Can I see? Nay. 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 So that's going to take care of D and G. Is it correct? Okay. okay. All right. And discussion and necessary action regarding drainage project. And you know what? I did not know when I got this, I did not realize that it was on there because I've got something that's going to correspond with that, and that's going to be that ordinance. It'd be item T. It's ordinance 2021-23 that was approved by the council November 15th. That's going to go along with that one. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. You know what, the city, this interim city administrator, I will tell you people, um, he has been very inclusive of me. He's been very good to contact me. Hey, Mayor, got this, blah, blah. And um, I appreciate his courtesy. I cannot express that enough. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So on item H, staff is recommending council approval of the drainage project for Mount Lane at an approximate cost of $15,000. We have been submitted uh, a video by a resident on Mount Lane, which will kind of give us uh, a look at the issue that we're dealing with there. And I'll kind of narrate what you're seeing when it pops up. So this is, this is the water that runs down between the two properties. So that's the water coming down between the two properties on Mount Lane. I think you have to hit hide. This is the water coming down in a heavy rain, and it goes down to the bar ditch. You see it splits into three sections there, and then it collects down in the bar ditch. It needs to be graded out. It pools there, and when this was shot, there was a, a log there, but even with that not there, this is what happens, and it backs up and stands like this. Now, the job would be to grade that out for about 100 yards. To, you see where it's down there at the end, where it's pooling there. It's not, it's not going out as quickly as it needs to to drain, and so the plan is to regrade that, clear out those culverts, and allow the water to drain in a manner of which will keep it from backing up. Um, this is, according to the engineer, and I believe he's online, we can check. Uh, what I'm told is that um, this is the fix that will keep it from eroding the subgrade of Mount Lane in that area that is causing the road to fail. We do have a, another project scheduled to chip seal that entire neighborhood, um, and we'd like to get this done as well. And I'll take any questions that y'all have. I'm going to make a motion to go ahead and approve the drainage project. I think we'll have to wait for the mayor to return. Uh, mayor Pro Tem, you're in charge right now, so we can move forward. So we have a motion. Is there a second? make a motion to approve the drainage project uh, hold hold it we're not I'm not through I need to add this in about the ordinance that applies we've got a motion that I mean we've got an ordinance it says and so that's what my next question is we either need to repeal that ordinance I believe legal has looked it. at this before and the ordinance in question does not 
uh, have anything to do with the discussion of the drainage project. Is that correct, Carvin? There's two separate ordinances that are involved here. Yeah, I've, I've looked at that question repeatedly, and I'm not sure exactly what the mayor's question is tonight, but there okay. is a motion on the floor which will either have to be withdrawn or seconded before you can go into discussion. Okay, so if you make the motion, well, that was clever. Um, no, I'm just, I'm concerned about this ordinance, and I know that it's in here in the packet that it wasn't what you intended, but that's what the ordinance says, that it is the homeowner's responsibility. But again, as, as I've repeatedly said, it does not preclude the city from taking action to address a drainage issue in an area. And that's what the engineer has told us, that this is a drainage problem that has to be addressed. It's not just a single homeowner problem. I think Kyle's issues, we've got issues in other areas as well. And, and again, that's going to be the prerogative of the council to decide how to spend the city's money. If the city wants to address every single drainage problem, it can try to, but you're limited by resources and you'll just have to decide which projects you want to tackle. Well, again, this this particular ordinance that you brought does not preclude the city from spending the money to fix that drainage problem. And what's the benefit of ordinances? The benefit of that ordinance was intended to require the adjoining property owners to clean out their drainage areas, to mow them themselves, to clean out the debris, to keep them up so that they would serve the purpose for which they were designed, which was to drain the water. So then, in other words, then this individual is getting an exception because we're going to take care of it at city expense because of the road. But there's other roads. Carvin, if I may, the ordinance that's on the agenda, that pertains to nuisance uh, maintenance, correct? Such as grass, debris, things like that. Um, I, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but if there is drainage in an area of the city that has been installed, it is the city's responsibility to maintain such drainage. Is that correct? Yes. I mean, it, it is our responsibility to maintain the overall drainage program, the overall right. drainage plan of the city. So if there is drainage that was installed, we have to maintain it. If there is no drainage installed in any certain area, such as some of the older parts of town, there's no drainage for us to maintain, so to speak. But that's not what the ordinance says. It says property subject to a drainage easement shall be maintained by property owner or adjacent property owner. Does that not apply? If, well, based on what Mr. McCabe says. That's, that's what I've said repeatedly. I don't believe that applies to this circumstance. These are two separate issues. It's still a drainage easement. I second the motion. You made the first one. Councilmember Ty did. any necessary action regarding the proposed tax rate for 2022 take a record vote and schedule the public hearing and this doesn't show actually what the rate is on what we got in the packet The agenda commentary should have our proposed tax rate at 0.437815 per hundred taxable property value. 
is less than last year's fiscal year of 0.450857. So the taxes have actually been lowered uh, a little over a penny. Um, and what staff is recommending is that approval of the proposed tax rate for 2023 with a record vote, and then we move forward with scheduling the public hearing. No possibility of running it even at the, the no new tax rate, no new tax revenue. Well, you, so the, the yeah, 8. so you, you gave me direction to give you numbers on that, and I believe I responded with an email to everyone. Um, we need to cut, I don't have the figure in front of me, but I think it's a little under 100000 from our budget if we lower it to that other rate. Vote on it now. Okay. I motion to approve the tax rate. We're just doing a record vote. I second. Is that correct, Mr. Atkins? Yes, well, what about the record vote? Like we did before. McCabe? Aye. Ty? Aye. Priest? Aye. Konefke? Thank you. And we'll go to L. That's the discussion necessary action regarding the QT site plan. Okay, so this is the QT that everybody's excited about going in. Well, most everybody. Oh. Hang on, we have to go back to that prior. I'm sorry, we need to schedule the public hearing for September 8th on the last item. Can you include that in your motion? Yes, the motion was to approve the tax rate and have a public hearing on September 8th. A second. Okay, for the record, McCabe? Aye. Ty? Aye. Priest? Aye. Kineski? Thank you. So back to QT. Um, we have a site plan that's been approved by both legal and our engineering firm with the caveat that QT must obtain the tech stock permits for the driveways and the water line installation. Those are the only two things left. Um, I did speak to Mr. Jonathan Schindler with Kirkman Engineering who said TxDOT has their plans. They've had them for about a month and they're hopeful they get the approval soon. But in his words, they're chomping at the bit to do this, but they can't move forward until they have those plans. So it, 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 it hinges on our approval of the site plan and TxDOT approving those two items. So what staff is asking for um, is that we approve this site plan with the stipulation that those permits are pulled before QT moves forward. And they understand that to be the case. I make a motion to approve the replat. Okay. Second. I'm, no, it's a site plan. It's not a replat. It's a site plan. We're on L. L. We probably should have put those together to make it a little more clear. Sorry about that. All right. I make a motion to approve the, what is it, site plan? Site plan, yes. With these stipulated conditions. I second. Aye. Go to M. Discussion and presentation regarding Prairie Point development. Thank you, Mayor. I have Mr. Troy Lewis here to give a presentation and an update on the planned Prairie Point development. Yes, Mr. Lewis. Okay. We'll probably do a little bit of both. Okay. Uh, good evening, Mayor, Council Members. My name is Troy Lewis with Rockwater Developments. My partner, Jody Boyd, is here with me. 
we'd like to go through a little bit of an update of the project, give you guys an idea of where we are in the process, uh, kind of explain what's been going on for the last six to nine months, um, and then also uh, go over, uh, have a brief overview about the incentive package that we have in mind that we'd like to bring forth for your consideration to um, help us and partner with us to get this development uh, off the ground and running. Uh, so quick background, some of you may already know this. I'm just gonna go through very quickly. I don't know all of the historical uh, path of this project, but Prairie Point currently is about uh, 361 acres just east of downtown. We have, um, uh, we're adjacent to uh, 114, also adjacent to Hickory on the north side. Uh, we'll get into the site plan and, and that type of thing a little bit later, but quick review of the project as I know it. Uh, there was a planned development that was approved on the site and I believe it was 2017. Uh, a certain developer had it at that time, was not able to make it work. The landowner kept the project, allowed another developer to try, I think in 2019. So we're here as the third time's the charm developer to try to get this project uh, done. Now, a lot of things have happened um, in, in, in a lot of ways it's been good. Uh, the, the real estate market, as everybody knows, is there's a huge demand to be in Dallas-Fort Worth. There's a huge demand to be in this particular area of North Texas. Uh, so the demand from builders to, to do lots, the speed at which we can get this development going uh, is much better than it was for those previous two developers. All that said, there's been a, uh, it is a very large project, it's a very expensive project. Uh, the city of Rome doesn't have the infrastructure to allow us to build uh, just straight away. So we've got to build our own infrastructure and that's one of the challenges we've been working through. So we got to a point at the beginning of the year, uh, working with your consultants, working with our consultants, having conversations back and forth to evaluate the numbers. Uh, and then we hit this inflationary period for the first few months of the year. So we kind of put everything on pause. Uh, you guys had an election. We knew there was some changeover happening here. We kind of redid our numbers in the last four to six weeks. So we re-engaged um, as you guys have, have kind of had a change of leadership and we appreciate the opportunity to come back. Our goal tonight is just to introduce ourselves. We've not had a chance to meet you, let you know who we are, let you know that we are really motivated to get this done before the end of the year. We are under contract. We don't own the property yet. We have a landowner that has allowed us the time to get to this point to um, work out a, a, an agreement with the city. So. The, the, the project is in the city limits. It is an approved project. And ultimately what we're trying to share with you guys is the financing mechanism that we need on the project to help make sure it happens. So I'm gonna bring up my partner, Jody Boyd. And I do have paper copies. If anybody would like a paper copy of the of the PowerPoint, let, wait, raise your hand and I'll just drop that off to you real quick. Sorry. You know what, I think I've already got it. Uh, what I'm looking for, though, is those list of incentives that you're going to be looking for. All right. Thank you, uh, Mayor, Council Members. Uh, we'll go ahead and, if you can go ahead and start the, uh, the PowerPoint here. <clears throat> My name is Jody Boyd. I'm partners with Troy at Rockwater Development. Um, we appreciate your time tonight. Um, what I'd like to talk about is the incentive that we're asking for and kind of give a brief overview of what that looks like, what it means, what it does for the city, what it does for us. Uh, PID is, stands for a public improvement district. So what that is is a public financing, financing mechanism through the assessment of bonds against the property that we have in a contract. So one of the things I want to highlight on this is the PIDs only apply to the landowners within that district. So PID bonds, when you sell PID bonds, you use them for infrastructure. It does not raise the tax rate for any of the existing citizens in the city of Rome. I want to be clear about that. It does not raise anyone else's tax rate. What it does do is raise the tax rate within our district. So what that helps us do is facilitate affordability and quality of development. So we can sell bonds to help us offset the costs of roads, water, sewer, storm drain, as we spoke about tonight earlier. So those things are helped borne by the assessment of it, by an assessment on the PID. Um, let's go to the next the next phase, please. 
Okay, a couple of things for uh, as far as the benefits to the city. Uh, the city council governs the pit. So the public improvement district is under the authority and the purview of the city council. Now those dollars can only be spent on our district because we're assessing ourselves for this infrastructure, but that is one of the benefits. The city has to sign off on what we do and what we don't do with those PID dollars. Um, the development pays for itself. In fact, we've already written a check to the city to help pay for the, the third party consultants, right? So it doesn't cost the city staff, it doesn't cost the city a, a penny, it pays for itself. Um, city retains 100% of the sales tax revenue created from online purchases in the development. And I've been doing this about 22 years. That's one of the things the law has recently changed on that is I wanna highlight here. Each one of these homes, and the, the, the project's already approved for a more, just over a thousand homes. Each one of these homes, is, it's a miniature supermarket. So anytime someone goes in that home and gets on Amazon or clicks online and buys something, that sales tax revenue comes to the city of Rome. So that's an added benefit to the city in that you're increasing your sales tax revenue through online purchases in new homes within the city. Uh, that's a very important component that I didn't understand until, until a couple of years ago, but that's a, a definitely an added benefit to the city. Um, the PID debt is non-recourse. So what that means is the city doesn't pay for it. It doesn't affect the city's bonding capacity or the city's borrowing capacity. That is strictly done through an assessment on the property itself. So one of the things, as we've reached out to the mayor and, and staff, we understand the fiduciary responsibility that city council has to the citizens. I want to make clear, we're not asking for this uh, a dollar from the city for this. We're not going to charge the city. We're going to pay our way as it goes. So I want to be clear about that. So it's no cost to the city. It's only a cost on ourselves. We're only obligating ourselves. Um, again, no impact on bond rating or bonding capacity. Uh, next one. <clears throat> what uh, PIDs enable us to do is increase the quality of the development while helping us finance the infrastructure. One of the major hurdles for this project is the off-site infrastructure that Troy mentioned. There's going to be a major sewer plant expansion, major off-site water costs, um, all the roads and water and sewer and storm drain that we put into the subdivision that we pay for and give to the city, right? That's what this helps do is, is to do that. And it also enhances uh, the timeliness of it. So we have fixed obligations. Essentially, PIDs are, are done for 30 years. So we'll, we'll borrow bonds from the bond market. We'll pay those bonds back with an assessment on the property itself. And in 30 years, it goes away. So the actual tax rate for those folks within our district in 30 years will diminish because the bonds are paid off. Uh, no, imp no impact on my property by the actions of others. So in other words, your house is not getting charged. Your house is not getting charged. No one's house in here is going to get charged. It's simply the homes that are within the district itself. Um, next slide. Uh, PID uh, disclosures. Okay, one of the major issues, if you start talking to people, PIDs have been around for about 30 years. Um, they haven't gotten popular until about the last decade or so. Now, one of the major pushbacks in the beginning of this program was a landowner would come and buy a house in Rome. They'd get their tax bill at the end of the year. They'd look down their tax bill and they'd see PIT assessment. And they'd see a dollar amount there on their PIT assessment. And they'd say, what is this tax? I didn't know I had to pay an extra tax. Well, the problem with that was disclosure, right? So then they would come up to city council members and say, why'd you approve this extra tax? I didn't know about that. Well, the legislature has moved in order to avoid that problem with uh, disclosures. So we'll disclose it at the title company. We'll disclose the, that there's going to be a PID at the sales contract. So throughout the process, we're disclosing to those potential home buyers, hey, there's going to be a little bit more fee at the end of the year on your tax bill. The reason that's going to be there is because we have an amenity center, we have a pool, we have trails, we have open space, the enhanced features of the subdivision. So that's you know one of the pushbacks we got early on as we started down this process not necessarily here in Rome, but in other municipalities, was just that understanding that, hey, full disclosure, full transparency. Okay, um, I'll open up for any questions. That's that's the, the high level bird's eye overview about what a PID does. And I just wanna be clear, and I wanna, I wanna say this again repeatedly, it does not cost any of the citizens of Rome a dollar. Only obligating ourselves as property owners to pay for it ourselves. 
So just want to make that clear to everyone. It will not increase the tax rate of the city of Rome. It will increase the tax rate incrementally for the subdivision itself, but that's part of the mechanism we use with which to get the quality and to pay for the infrastructure. So happy to open it up to any questions. Uh, we have another component of this called the TERS, which Troy will come up and kind of detail, but we appreciate your time tonight. We know service is not necessarily always the, the easiest to do, so we appreciate what y'all are doing. So thank you very much. Yes, and, and feel free to raise hands, stop us along the way. Again, we want this to be pretty simple. Uh, we don't want to get too detailed, but we want you to start understanding what it is. And if nothing less, you can leave the meeting, do some research, and if you have other questions, I've got an open conversation going with the city administrator. We'd be happy to answer any questions we have. Uh, one of the things, too, I want you to know, this isn't Jody and my program. We hire professionals. We hire a PID attorney. Um, this was created by DPFG. There are PID consultants. This is what they do. They put the analysis together to help us figure out with a given tax rate that you guys were talking about tonight, what is our ability uh, within a tax rate that's marketable. We can't come in here and say, well, we're going to do a $500 million PID and everybody's tax rate's going to be $5, $5 instead of $3. It doesn't work like that because it's not marketable. They're the consultants that help us, that help the city kind of take care of everything and keep it in, uh, in good shape. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do is make it marketable. So as Jody talked about that assessment, it's really part of, you know, when you have a tax bill, it's rolled into your mortgage. It kind of becomes your monthly payment. You know what it is. This is no different. It'll be rolled into that um, that escrow, I guess you could say, for mortgage companies. Uh, but what it does is it allows our builders, it allows us to sell our lots to the builders at a price that is marketable even with that assessment. If we didn't have this public infrastructure financing mechanism, we wouldn't be able to get the prices to a point we could even sell them. And that's the big problem with this project that we think we've solved. And that's what we're here to kind of get over the finish line. So um, let me go through the, I'm going to look down, Jody, look back. I'm going to look down at the um, last few slides here. So there's, there's two components. Jody talked about the public improvement district and how it's an assessment. Another part of the, oh, I know what I was going to say. So um, as part of our PID assessment, and the city has you know access to these documents, and we'll continue to share the updates. So you got a lot of you guys may know there's other there's other uh, developments in the area. Reunion across the way, they've got a financing mechanism called a MUD. So it's different, but they have a you know one dollar assessment that that calculates in their taxes as well. And there's also I know Wildflower is a development on 114. All of those districts along this way, everybody has a public improvement district, a financing mechanism to help them get there. So like Jody said, 15 years ago, it was pretty rare in the state of Texas, but over the last 10 years, it's become a necessary tool to provide the homes for all the people moving to town. I mean, that's one of the great things we love about our governor is he's an entrepreneurially spirited governor. We have, you know, I think top three um, Fortune 500 company headquarters are now in Texas. So we've really seen that growth. And part of the way we keep supporting that is we provide housing to do that. So um, Jody and I also have other projects in other cities. I know this would be the first PID uh, TERS that you guys have considered as a city. We also have done that in Decatur. We did two, their first two here in the last 18 months, or really last 12 months. And we're talking to other cities about doing the same thing. So while it's new and unique to you guys, it's not, there, there's been almost 200 done in the state of Texas over the last 10 to 20 years. So um, that's why we're here to try to introduce it to you, help you get comfortable with it, help create some questions so we can answer those before we get into the nitty gritty. So sorry for being long winded. Let me move into what a tax increment reinvestment zone is. Basically, uh, again, this is not a new tax, but it, you basically know that on every uh, ad valorem property tax bill, the city has um, a tax rate. What we're proposing and what generally everybody proposes when they have a tax, uh, a TERS, is to share that uh, tax rate with the city to help invest into our, pro or our, our project. So for example, instead of coming to the city and saying, the only way you guys are going to get a thousand new homes in the next five to ten years is if you guys spend millions of dollars on infrastructure. This is an avenue for us to share in the revenue we're helping create 
by the city reimbursing into our project or reimbursing some of those funds back into our project. There, there, there's a couple different ways that happens. One of it is, um, you know, those taxes are collected and they're shared uh, and reimbursed to the developer over time. Another way is they are, they are calculated on the front end and allow us to have a higher PID um, assessment or PID proceeds to help offset our costs. Again, the details will come as we present actual numbers, but just so you guys know, it's, it's another mechanism, but it's the same thing as Jody was saying. It's not going to affect anybody in the city. It, it's going to be a mechanism that helps us expedite um, the development and keep it at a marketable price to be able to do so. And if we we'll go to the one where we talk about eligible improvements, so, so basically, if we look at a given project, and this is pretty, whether it's here or Decatur or another city that we're, we're talking about, those funds that we calculate from a PID and a TERS aren't going to cover 100% of the cost. Give or take, 75 to 80% of those costs are eligible, but there's just some costs uh, that, that aren't part of that. This just shows that gives you examples of what is covered. A lot of the, the public infrastructure, for sure, landscaping, um, parking facilities, you know, that type of thing. So just a, a quick list for you guys to review and, and understand what we can use that for. Last slide on the PID TERS is there's a team. It's not, it's not just the city manager and I working out all the details. No, the city has their staff, they have their attorney, they have their consultants. We have the same and everybody coordinates together. And like Jody said, with the um, with the uh, oh, the, the city controls the process. It's kind of the same thing. So so the the PID TERS is going to be a collective uh, effort to get this thing done and uh, signed off on. So again, I may have made that too long winded, a little bit more confusing. But those two mechanisms, while they're different, we'd like to use them together. And one of the reasons, if you'll jump to the page after our site plan, one of the reasons, if you'll jump down to this third line, you'll see that on just the single family portion of our development, there's $68 million of eligible costs that we would like to use a PID TERS financing mechanism for. So that means there's, you know, give or take, $80 million is what it's going to cost us to develop uh, the, the 1,086 lots that we have on the plan today. So this is an approved plan from 2017. We're just now in a position, given the market where it is, given this financing mechanism and what we've kind of uh, worked out from a game plan standpoint, that we can, we can bring this project to the city. When it's all said and done, the build out will be uh, over $425 million of ad valorem tax value uh, from this project. So. Again, the city's going to share with those sales tax from orders they make online. It's also going to have property taxes and a portion of which is going to go back to the city. Uh, while I'm here, I'll just kind of give you a quick review and then I'll just kind of show you the plane. You can't see it very well. That's why I didn't want to spend too much time there. But like I said, it's 361 acres. Roughly about 276 of that is for single family homes, open space, some drainage is included in that and, and, and that type of thing. And we've got about 85 acres for mixed use commercial. The definition is, is commercial and multifamily for that 85 acres. Uh, we're less certain what that's going to look like. So while we will present uh, some ideas about that uh, incentive ask to help develop that portion, it may take a little bit more time to really get down to the nitty gritty. The, um, the single family has already gone through multiple iterations, so it's easy to put a calculus on how many homes, what size homes are going to be, and that type of thing. In our phase one of about 250 to 300 lots, we're projecting the average uh, home price is going to be $356,000. So it's it's been a crazy market, and over the last three years, a, a, a entry home, entry level home, is very difficult to get in the 200s uh, anymore. But th that's kind of where we're projecting some of that. Homes will be closer to 300, some may be a little bit higher than 350, but that's the average as we're projecting it. Uh, so then ultimately, just kind of a wrap up, you know, we've got three different or two different mechanisms that we kind of explained. Another generally normal mechanism that's that's discussed is, is impact fee credits. That's basically when we pay a fee for water and sewer for each home, the city would credit us back for us putting in all the infrastructure and that type of thing. So it's basically a conversation that has not been finalized with the city 
but that's why we wanted to come here, share with the council, and be able to answer any questions that you might have and let you know that while it's number, the first one that we know of in the city of Rome, uh, it's not the first that's been done in this area, and that's what a lot of large developments like this are utilizing to be able to develop and be marketable uh, today. Jody, did I miss anything? All right, again, yes. So the ad valorem taxes that you said would redirect, is that something that's negotiated how long they're redirected? Or? Yes, Okay. good question. So we are limited by the number of eligible dollars. And, and, and let me just preface this with the final minute detailed answer that always is gonna come from somebody other than us. It's gonna be a consultant or an attorney. But basically, so you know, number one, we are limited by those eligible costs. So in this case, if it costs us $80 million to build 1,000 lots, um, we're limited to only recouping 68 million through those mechanisms, right? So in one calculus, just to give you an example, in one calculus, it might be 34 million comes from the PID and 34 million comes from the TERS. So even if the city and, and we, negotiated a different kind of mechanism that allowed 40 million in TERS, because we have a limit on the eligible, it would stop. So there's a calculus, depending on how we use it, where it can't go over that eligible amount, that eligible amount total. Um, and like Jody said, the, um, the, um, the PID is limited. So mud districts generally go on forever. PIDs are gonna be limited to about that 30 year time frame. If we did uh, one of the versions of the TERS, it'll also have a limit. It would be a, you know, however many years it takes us to, ma to max out to get to that whatever is eligible, it won't go on forever, that sharing. So that's, that's again, one of the benefits to the city that, yes, we're sharing this ad valorem tax with the city because you guys are going to get the infrastructure to have all of this all to yourselves in the future. That's basically how that works. And then ultimately, kind of what Jody was signaling to me, the calculus that while we understand it, we let the guys who know how to run the numbers help us with this, is that $3, you guys were talking about 45 cents for every hundred, $3 total tax rate and assessment is kind of our target. So we run numbers anywhere from 290 to 305 to 310, and that's comparable to other projects in the area. So going back to, you know, we can't do what's just best for us. We've got to do what's good for the city. We have to do what's good for the builders. The builders aren't going to buy lots from us if we don't set it up till we are, it's a cost and a profit margin that works for them. So that, that's kind of the um, general target. And if you look at other projects and when we run our analysis and share it with y'all as consultants, it'll show our projects in Decatur and what were those calculated at and what we're proposing here and what did Wildflower do uh, down the road on 114 over there so everybody has an idea because ultimately for the builders it needs to be marketable it can't be so different that it that it's not marketable but um, ultimately we're utilizing that to keep it marketable and, and to do the best we can as far as design and as far as amenities and that type of thing any other questions Okay, well, we look forward to being back very soon. We'll coordinate with uh, your leadership uh, here in the next couple of weeks. We'll put some hard numbers on paper so y'all's consultants can review those. Our consultants and attorneys will get back into that conversation. And ultimately, we're looking to, you know, in the next two to three months, come back with a proposal, what we're looking at. Everybody have talked about it and work towards a developer's agreement on paper. And that's kind of our all-encompassing contract that says, city agrees developer agrees this is the framework which with which we can work on and then we know we can move forward and and, and have that financing mechanism so thanks very much we didn't plan to take all that time but we really felt like it was important to share this with you yes. thank you thank you all right um i've got some changes on the agenda Again, um, we're going to go to Q at this point. We'll come back to NOP. Um, we're going to go to Q. 
Discussion necessary action regarding Rome Municipal Ordinance Section 1.04.007, approval of legal documents. Um, that particular ordinance, that's why I'm very confused about actions that council took on August 4th about um, giving the mayor pro tem uh, equal authority to the mayor because it seems to me that you're almost creating like a shadow government without any checks and balances. And um, this one in particular, it says that this particular ordinance that I've got on here, this basically says the mayor signs, signs all legal documents to be attested by the city secretary and approved by the city attorney. Um, in reference to the contracts that are also on here, those contracts were not provided to the members of the council. According to Josh McCabe, only he, the city administrator, and the city attorney had those contracts in their hands. No one else saw them. Um, I didn't see the documents until the following week. They were never presented for my signature. In fact, they were not prepared for my signature. They were already prepared for the Mayor Pro Tem signature. The Mayor Pro Tem made an announcement that he spoke for the majority of council which suggests to me that this was a, a, a determination that was made outside of a public meeting. Um, which brings us back to the other thing that's, that was brought up about that first meeting on July 28th when we were in the back and this was admitted later that Josh McCabe was designated to negotiate. When we came out of executive session, I asked the city attorney, what action? And you told me no action. And the truth be known, I believe that we should have come out of that executive session and you're not supposed to take any ex action, to my understanding, in executive session. It's supposed to be done in public and it appears that what we should have done was come out of there and said make a motion for Josh McCabe to negotiate. As it turned out, Josh, McG Josh McCabe, I mean we didn't go by that, it was just, okay, as it turned out, the following week, Josh McCabe, the mayor pro tem, had not only negotiated the contract, he worked with the city uh, a lawyer to draw the contracts up with his signature, not with mine. And, um, and I know that it was said that, oh, well, you could have looked at him in the back. And I did, I, I think there was something mentioned about that. However, I think the response was these do not go out of this room. Um, it's customary, I would think, that with any type of a contract that involves any amount of money, uh, particularly this one's worth $125,000, um, it's customary to give the council and the mayor time to look over a contract, review it, see what's in it. Because as it turned out, some of what was in it was not disclosed. And it was on social media this week that, oh, well, no, she didn't resign. You know, wait a minute, but she did resign. I came out of the executive session on August 4th, and I said pertaining to Ms. Northrop's resignation. She did resign, but now social media is, oh, no, she didn't resign. This was a no-fault no agreement, which is well and good, I guess, but I believe that every member of the council and myself, we should have had access to those documents before they were ever signed. And um, this is all kind of together. And I think it's very confusing for our interim city administrator. He has been, I will tell you, he has been very gracious to me. And it's a world away from the way Miss Northrop had treated me. Um, he has been so gracious. And the other day when I was in there, he said, I need to talk to you. I'm giving you compliments, Mr. S interim city administrator. Um, and I said, look, you know, he says, can I talk to you? And I said, no, you're going to get us in trouble with the council, oh, you know. So he has been very gracious and accommodating towards me. And in fact, including me in the Prairie Point thing, I'm not sure that Mrs. Wilson was included much on that. And um, so, like I said, but they've put him in an awkward position of, you know, now he answers, he can't necessary I mean he's been very gracious to communicate with me but he answers not to me but to Josh McCabe and I remember in years past 
it was said at the council that unless you're in the unless you're at a council table, you don't have any authority. And it's not as if I'm going to go swinging any weight around because I don't have any to throw. Um, but uh, my whole purpose, actually, I've got several. I don't have a personal agenda. I wanted to get us back on a sound financial footing. It, that, that was one of the things I hoped for. And I had also hoped that we would, we would get back into a certain amount of transparency because there's been very little of that. And this is a perfect example of that, as I say, because those contracts were signed, done, deal before anybody ever saw them. Um, Kathy, do you have anything to add? Well, I, I guess my question is, you're talking about these legal documents. If only the mayor can sign it, um, then does that make those that contract null and void? In my legal opinion, is those are enforceable contracts that the mayor pro tem was authorized to sign them, and they were signed in proper fashion. Okay. Seems to me those contracts, if you didn't go by the ordinance that we do have in place, um, I'm not sure that an ordinance. I that's what I mentioned with the other one. Do, do you not have to repeal an ordinance and replace it with something else that you want, or do ordinance just not apply, or we just pick and choose? The council has the authority to designate someone to represent it in executing a contract, and it did in that instance. It, it asked the mayor pro tem to execute the contract. Okay, but there were at least three of us that weren't aware of that. Well, again, the council speaks and the city speaks by majority vote action of the council. I understand that, but should this not have been made public? I don't know that, like I said, Josh McCabe came out and he said he speaks on behalf of the other three. Um, but I don't know at what point you all got together and decided that he would be doing your speaking for you. So let's set a few things straight. Of course. Are you done? Go. Okay. At no time has this council instructed anyone to not talk with, contact, or in any other way work with city staff. What we have said multiple times is that this council has no power outside of a council meeting. Therefore, you cannot instruct or tell city staff to do anything. You can conversate with any city staff at any time. So when you keep saying, Mayor, that we told you you cannot conversate with them, that is wrong. It's in the ordinance. It is in the ordinance. It says that. It does not say that you cannot talk to them. It does say the mayor and council shall not, you can, it, inquiry only, but it all has to go through the city administrator. Inquiry only means you can talk to them. Okay. We've had two executive session meetings on these contracts. All of us were involved in those discussions. You could ask questions at any time. The first meeting, we all decided that you were going to authorize me to negotiate and execute, and that is what I did with the help of our lawyer and the individuals. As I stated last time, our lawyer did not work with the individuals. He even advised them to go seek their own counsel. So he had no individual or representation for any individual other than the council. You do not, best practice is to not give out uncompleted contracts. If you're in the middle of a negotiation, you want to keep those private. That way the information is not given out and tainted or anything in any other way. You were offered, every person on this council, was offered those contracts in that meeting to look at. And at that time, nobody took them. So don't say that nobody got to look at them because you had every right to look at them. Nice spin. Well, actually, they did. It was when Patrick asked, but that was towards the end of the meeting. And it was and that's 1030 was, at night. Yeah, and but it was, you came out of executive session. No sooner was the council meeting over right. and you were signing your name. 
but like I said, we should have had a little bit of time. This stuff with doing this at the last minute, and you know, well, you got to do it right now. You know, I mean, council as a courtesy, council should have had a day or two to look those over, so that we would know what was in them. You could have asked at any time in executive session. They were explained. They were offered again until they are signed and completed. They do not need to leave executive session. And you took care of that. On the authority of the council. Y'all okay. authorized me to do so. So we I did. signed this contract. And then, what, two days later, we find out that actually Ms. Northrup has another job. She was looking. And she knew she was going to have another job. And as our lawyer also stated, that has no bearing on the discussion of these contracts. Everything we have done is above board and legal per our lawyer. I would have to disagree that it was above board because it was not. Was it all legal? Well, apparently, I'll, I'll apparently the was, city attorney says so. If there is any question about the authority of the mayor pro tem to execute those contracts the council can ratify those contracts tonight by majority vote and that will remove any any cloud that there might be over the consideration of those contracts I, whether I mean, they're ratified or not taxpayers are out $125,000 on those contracts well, you know at I, least. I, I would like to say a couple of things first of all every step of the way we ask the attorney to be a part of that because he represents the city. When we offered that contract and it had that clause in to the, for the city uh, administrator, it was passed unanimously by the city council. That didn't change anything in that contract. One of the reasons and the discussion that went on in closed session was that there was tension between the mayor and the possible interim person. Now, I can drag all that trash out here if that's what it takes, but that was the reason that we thought it best for that negotiation part to be done without that tension between that. Also, we have a history of since um, the new mayor was sworn in where she refuses to sign documents. It's very clear that is part of her ministerial duties. Three. Three, I refuse to sign. Well, you refuse. Three. How would we know that whenever all we... of them? So that, um, that's my I, one I of think my I other was questions. talking. I okay. was talking. So we didn't know if when we got to the end and that there was a contract that was a approved, uh, an ordinance that was approved, then um, was it going to get signed? That's, that's and some of the things that you did not sign held up business for the city. And so we can't, we were in a situation where was business going to happen? Was business going to flow? What we're going to do if you didn't like it you didn't sign it and so that that was a, a thing that we had to work around was it something we wanted to do no did we want to come out of here and say we're spending one hundred twenty five thousand dollars because we've had this environment with our employees and let you just cannot ignore five people standing there telling you those stories over and over again so you can blame us and you can say that we did it and you can say that we're guilty and we ought to resign. And I'm telling you, you need to be blaming the people that put us in that position. And yes, I'm emotional and I am sad for this town. I'm sad for this whole conversation. And so we did what was the right thing with the information that we had and not everybody out here gets to hear it because it is closed session. And we talked about every detail in those meetings. If you didn't understand that you had a chance to ask, if you wanted to see the document and read it, you, after the attorney went on, went through it, you had the right to do it. And so what? It was 1030. Heck, we had a, we had a city council meeting that went to 230 in the morning one time because it needed to be done. So, 
I make a motion that we ratify these two documents that were legally signed and legally done all along anyway. But I make that motion to ratify. I'd like to just make one more comment before you. You're inferring, I, I'm, basically you are inferring that as of August 4th, we could not wait, we could not have waited a day or two to allow counsel, everyone to take a look at those contracts. It had to be done that night. Did you ask? Are you saying that city business would stop? No, I'm asking you a question. Are you saying that city business would stop if we didn't have a day or two to over, to look at those contracts in broad daylight and let the council look at them, perhaps make any amendments, any adjustments? Sure, you had a chance that night to say, give that me more night. time. That but night. But you didn't. You didn't ask for that, and you could have. But you did not. It was all about I where never you... expected you all to pull off what you pulled off and signing those at 1030 at night. And you had no idea whether, you know, yes, there are a couple of th th three things, I believe, that I would not sign on. And two of them were checks under this contract because I don't think... It may not be illegal, but I think it was highly irregular, and I do believe uh, not allowing the council, all of the council and the mayor to see those contracts, regardless of whether they were back there, that we did not have time to review them, offer amendments if necessary. I do think that's a very, very perilous uh, precedence to set. You did not ask, and you got up, and we said, does anybody else have any questions? And you got up and walked out here. So you missed your opportunity because you did not speak up. Okay. I will say they were offered to us at the end, and it was only after Patrick brought, brought them up. Yeah, but it was right. told we were told we could not take them out of that the room. Is a, that is a condition of closed so, session. Yeah. However, you know, no chance to review it prior to the meeting was a little bit disturbing to the, some of us. This, that that whole event comment. was disturbing to everybody, and let me let me just tell you that we did not do anything illegal. We didn't want to do it. We didn't want to be in that position. And so for all of the the abuse that we have taken, even here in session, and nobody stopped it whenever we were maligned, we did not break any laws. And we didn't want to do that. But it, we were in a position that other people had put us in. And in order to protect people from being possibly sued, we didn't have any other options. Thank you very much for that. So we, there's a motion. A second. All in favor? Aye. You favoring the ratification of those contracts? No, they're going to, they're standing. Okay. All right. Um, Um, the other thing I want to talk about is I'd ask for an itemized list of the half a million, or more than half a million dollars that Josh McCabe had um, indicated the city of Rome had spent on employee resignations. And I don't know that we really have an itemized list of those expenditures. I'm glad you brought this up, Mayor. In a previous meeting, I did make a statement that the actions of three individuals has directly resulted in the loss of funds in excess of $500,000 based on what employees have claimed as hostile work environment created by the current mayor, previous mayor, and previous council member. I will now admit that at that time, I was way off on my calculations. Upon further research, I have recalculated that number and will now explain how I came up with it. Upon my research, it is proven that uh, U.S. businesses do spend $1 trillion in dollars every year based on the resignations of their employees. Uh, that's businesses are losing every year due to the turnover, and the most astounding part is that most of this damage is self-inflicted, such as in this case. 
The research also shows that cost of replacing an individual employee can range up to two times the employee's annual salary. Adding in a highly competitive and tight labor market to the mix, and most organizations probably couldn't survive the loss of good people, which that is what we're working with. Voluntary turnover costs money, but as any leader or manager knows, turnover has many costs that never register directly on the spreadsheet, such as uh, overtime, interviews, research for other employees, et cetera, et cetera. Internally, it also breaks down the team morale. Exter externally, it can mean lost customer relationships. Depending on the quality of the exit, it can also threaten your brand or at worst, lead to litigation which is why we did some of these contracts to keep the city out of litigation. 52% of voluntary exiting employees say their manager or organization could have something to could have done something to prevent them from leaving their job. So with that research, based on that, I will now discuss the reasoning behind the several uh, of our employees resigning and how it has affected the city monetarily. So based on exit interviews and statements of employees um, of our public works director, the note shows on his exit interview that there is negative politics, personal attacks. Pro he left to protect the public works employees by removing the target that he felt that he was of political attacks. Another statement from a former employee on March 12th of this year, Miss Patty Mitchell declared in one of her rants on her self-proclaimed page, Rome Watch, that the city of Rome had only one employee. Again, as usual, she misspoke. I have worked for the city of Rome for the last three years and two months. Today is my last day working for the city. I have decided to go ahead and call it quits after 20 years working for various municipalities. I was hired here by Lance Petty, who is a good public works director. Lance and I had worked together for 10 years in another city. I was hired to operate and maintain the wastewater plants and to help out where needed. Later, I was also given the responsibility of enforcing code since I had a code license. Of all the cities I have worked for, Rome by far is the best. The people here are generally friendly and understanding, but the thing that makes it worth driving an hour each way is employees, although there are only three of us in the public works department. These men and I work with are the finest I have ever known. The city is very lucky to have them and should do everything in their power to keep them here. When Lance Petty moved on to greener pastures, we were pretty scared as to who the next public works director would be. We did not need to worry as the then mayor, Michelle DeCredico, and the new city administrator, Cynthia Northrup, hired the absolutely best person for the job, Sean Densmore, who was also recommended by Lance Petty. Sean has years of experience leading Lake Worth's public works. Sean is a man of strong faith. Sean also works very hard to show physical responsibility in his budgeting and operations practices. I would say, in my opinion, he is above reproach. All that being said, the following is my two cents about your politics. If you believe the pure unmitigated swill the manipulation of the truth and the outright lies that is posted on Rome Watch by Patty Mitchell, Joanne Wilson, Lisa Wilson, Ashley Majors, to name a few, then you deserve everything you get, which will be a whole lot of nothing for your tax dollars. Miss Mitchell has wasted city funds by inundating City Hall with freedom of information requests. Each time the employees have to stop what they are doing to retrieve the information. From pictures she has posted on Rome Watch of the waste, West Wastewater Treatment Plant shows she was clearly trespassing on posted property. I would assume the subsequent visit by the TCEQ and the related fines was due to her calling them. Her pettiness has been related to me by a citizen who worked with her at American Airlines. You know, Josh, everybody can read that on social media, and you're the one who brought up that the um, ordinance we've got about attacking specific individuals. And that is, you are attacking Wilson, you're attacking me, you're attacking uh, majors. I'm not um, attacking anyone. I'm reading a statement from a former employee. Let's wrap Please it up. Please do not interrupt me. I am going to interrupt. I will speak as long as I need to to answer the question you asked me to answer. 
uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the million dollars. What does that have to do with the million dollars or five million dollars or half a million dollars? It goes to show why he resigned from the city and why he is a – All right. So – That's it. Okay. She has made it her goal to undermine and snipe at members of council and city staff to the point that there is a lawsuit against her for defamation of character. Very rarely has she ever reported anything positive about the city. The BS numbers she posts are oftentimes skewed, misinterpreted, or just outright false. I ask you, is this the person you want as the figurehead of your city? You have seen what happens when you put someone in that position that has no clue as to what their responsibilities are. Which brings me to Miss Mayor Joanne Wilson and Councilwoman Majors. While I am trying to find something Here positive to say about them, I guess all I can come up with is thank God they are not running for re-election. The stories from staff of them constantly browbeating and actually screaming at staff members to point that they were afraid of physical violence and had to call the public works director to city hall to defuse the situation are regular. In closing, I would like to say that despite all the petty political squabbling and vedettes against those that you perceive are against you, I have greatly enjoyed my time here serving the city of Rome. I wish the best for the city. You're going to grow. You're not going to be the city you were 40 years ago. With growth comes change, whether you like it or not. Please try to get along, folks. Make good decisions. It's okay to ask questions and question things. There is just no need to be loud, rude, bitter, and hateful. Finally, again, thank you for allowing me to serve your city and work with the greatest team I have ever had the chance to serve with. And then the final statement I have from another resignation. One of the reasons for retiring is that it was time to give the same dedication to my family as I did the fire service for the last 28 years. The other reason I am retiring was the political climate that surrounds and suffocates the city of Rome, especially staff. It is city staff having to deal with some council members and the mayors having a pessimistic attitude towards daily operations, causing daily operations and priorities to suffer which in turn created a hostile work environment. City staff morale was low at times due to the unsolicited visits by the same people who continued to press their personal agendas and attempted to separate staff to play the he said, she said game and remind everyone they are not doing enough. Lack of support and respect by some council members and mayors towards department staff. Even though we were told how much they loved us in council meetings it was not the same way we were treated behind closed doors. Even going as far as allowing citizens to demean and personally attack city staff during council meetings and town forums without even giving enough respect to the staff position and having the people stop. You didn't have to be friends with the staff, but they should have had enough respect, decency, and professionalism to stop the personal verbal attacks on staff. What really takes the cake is they turned around and said they were the victim of the attacks. Mayors and some council members did not attend some city sponsored events, not to mention not showing up for a department head retirement. The same mayor when running for office came by the fire station when I wasn't there and proceeded to tell the firefighters we would never be a paid department. We will always be volunteers made comments on why we had beds because we didn't need to sleep at the fire station along with telling the crew we needed to go to an ESD. I could go on and on and fill about 10 pages of stuff that has happened and there's no way you can make this stuff up. It is not something a normal person expects or thinks of. Then I remind myself, except for a few years in the middle, nothing has changed the political climate of personal agendas for the eight years I was here. I wish the citizens of Rome the very best as I had gave my best to make sure Rome was a safe place to live and visit. I do think Rome was and will be a great place to live. We just need to quit playing all the games and setting up personal agendas to create power for a few individuals who have no idea how to use that power for the good of the community. I always said I welcomed opposition, but it keeps you on your toes as a leader. But when you don't understand what your opposition is trying to do and you're left, left scratching your head on a daily basis, that's not opposition. That's people who don't understand and do not see the big picture and are in it for personal gains. God bless, Daryl Fitch. So all of these statements cite the actions of these three individuals in particular resulted, at least impartial, the reasoning for why the employees resigned. So based on the research and the statements of those who resigned, let's now go over the estimated costs. 
And again, according to research, it shows that um, it could cost the city up to two times a person's salary. And because our city employees are paid well below the average, I did use that full two times. So when you take in the public works director salary who resigned, the fire chief salary who resigned, the city secretary who resigned, the public works employee who resigned, the city administrator who uh, left, the interim city secretary that we had to hire, the interim city administrator, and approximately 25 to 30 percent of legal fees is associated to these three individuals, not counting open records requests, overtime, lost man hours, employee searches, et cetera, et cetera. The actions of these three people have cost the city $1.2 million at a minimum. So a more accurate number for the amount of funds expended unnecessarily by the actions of our current mayor, previous mayor and previous council member, and the negative politics and illegal actions they and their political group have caused the city is in excess of that $1 million. Funds that could have been better used for facility maintenance, equipment, events, park maintenance, and so on. This is why all members of the council need to conduct themselves accordingly to uphold their oath of office and not abuse their power, to act professionally and not in a vindictive way, to find ways to support and maintain our employees so as to not have such a high turnover rate costing the city more costly expenditures. $1.2 million the city has had to pay because of the poor actions of these three individuals. So that is how I came up with that number. I will tell you, when I ran, I hadn't expected to run for mayor, but when I learned that Mrs. Wilson wasn't going to run, we weren't, my, I, my feeling was we would not let Josh McCabe uh, walk away with it. And um, that started in 2018. He's going to remember that. Um, but I did, my overall philosophy was it was time for us to move past these old grudges and focus on cost-effective solutions that would best serve the needs of our community. And I believe from the very beginning, May the 18th, that we weren't all on the same page. You made the motion basically about council only and employees being in City Hall and that I couldn't talk to the city administrator without a witness. And these were all things I had no control over. And I have come at this, I've, I've tried my best in good faith. And I yes, I do look at expenses. I'm, I'm very conscious of, of watching expenses. And I often brought that up on Rome Watch as well. Um, at the time, oddly, as the time that Will Osborne retired, it seems as though he had actually left and then came back because we were short ahead because Jesse had left. And then after Bill Osborne left, Jesse had come back because it, what he said to me on the corner one day, he says, gosh, I just couldn't leave Chris alone. And um, which I appreciate that type of camaraderie. And I've always said how much I appreciated their hard work. But the three of you want Josh McCabe. I'm not going to resign. But of course, you can override me at any turn and you will, I'm sure. Um, and I don't have a personal agenda other than trying to get us back on a solid foundation and get us back to where, um, you know, we're, we're working within the community. And I started that even before, uh, before I was elected. And um, anyway, but that's where we are. We do have an, a ter terribly divided council, folks. And... Um, I see the stuff that comes out on social media. Anyway, that's all I have to say about it. No, I'm not even saying it was about me. I'm talking about what's happening with those contracts, what I've seen on social media. Nope. I've stayed out of it. 
I've stayed out of it. I haven't posted anything, anything controversial on Rome Watch at all. Um, you know what? I think I'm going to take a breather. I'll be back next council meeting. Josh wants to be mayor real bad, so we're going to let him. Excuse me. Thank you. I'll be back. I'll be back next council meeting. No, I do want to do my job. I, I'm going to preserve. I'm going to preserve my own sanity because what you people are doing is nuts. Please, there's no, no comments from the audience at this time. time. We're holding the she meeting. Anyway, good night. No, you need to sit down. There is no discussion at this time. Then you can wait till it. Everybody, please stop or you will be asked to leave this meeting. Please, that's enough. Everybody, we will conduct this meeting professionally. This is your final warning or you will be leaving. Enough. Go. Please allow time for that person to leave before Miss Coffee leaves. Thank you. In the absence of the mayor, the mayor pro tem becomes the presiding officer of the meeting and he can complete the meeting as posted on the agenda. Thank you. So let's go back to item N, discussion and necessary action regarding insurance clause on park contracts. Um, I asked this to be on here because I think there was some confusion from people wanting to rent the pavilion for different events. Uh, there's some sort of insurance clause in there. Can Does staff have any information as to how much, what it is? Can you just explain that, please? We're talking about the pavilion in order to rent the pavilion there is a stipulation in the ordinance that states that you have to have a, a bond I, I don't know the exact amount um, it, yeah I don't think it specifies however we have not enforced that um, people who are having bigger events 100 plus people of course we would want them to do something as far as that goes but family birthday parties or plant sales or you know, just small events, it, it seems like it's more work for us and the people who are using the park. I'm considering we have insurance on the park. So, Carbon, even if they don't provide the bond, then the city's still covered in case of accident or something like that? Yes, as far as the city's liability, we're covered. Again, part of my thinking on that way back when when we added that was it, it gave if somebody came to us I think there was a circus or something coming through town and they wanted the opportunity to use our facilities well my thinking at the time was a big operation like that we ought to get a bond or we ought to get some kind of insurance protection from the city just to add to our our protection because it's potential liability was just we didn't know what it was so the idea was if a I don't know, a, tra a traveling show came through and they presented to us and they otherwise qualified to use the city park, it would at least give us that opportunity to add the insurance requirements so that we could protect the city's interest. It, it is waivable and if it's a small birthday party or you know family gathering, there's no need for insurance. But it was added so that the city had that as an option in, a, in the event of you know one of these traveling shows that goes through that they otherwise meet the requirements of our ordinance and they would have a right to probably use the facility. We felt like, well, at the very least, we ought to in require insurance. So at, who, at whose discretion would that fall to? Is that? Well, initially it'd be the city administrator's discretion and on any city administrator action, if a person doesn't ag agree to it, they have a right to appeal it to the council. And so it would come, come back to the council. But 
to my knowledge, that's never it's never come up. But presumably, the city administrator would call me and say, Carvin, what's the potential risk here? What what happens if a Ferris wheel falls apart? Are we potentially liable? And you know, what would TML cover and that that sort of thing? And so we do an analysis and try and come up with a reasonable number that made sense. And oftentimes these kinds of businesses have insurance already. And so maybe it's just a matter of them presenting to us what their standard policies are. And, you know, if they come in with a, uh, a recognizable insurance company and a bonding company that I can, can verify by, you know, checking the, the rating services against, then, you know, we would probably approve it. But again, it was a little bit of an unknown. We didn't know what we would be reviewing. And so we had, we thought we'll get, get some experience under a belt and we'll decide if it's not working, then we'll come back to the council and, and amend it. Uh, as opposed to creating a specific dollar amount that we didn't really have any idea whether it would make sense or not make sense. Any other questions, concerns on this? I don't think we need to take any action. No, no action. It was more of just a discussion, but we put action just Do in you case. Hi, Kathy. Um, the bond, that's not something that we pay for, right? Or is that how does that work for the insurance? No, that would be provided by the uh, party that's, that's renting, renting it. it. Okay, yeah. So I want to make sure. Okay. Yeah, and like Carvin said, the city still has insurance even if there's not a bond. So either so way. we're fine. It's just them protecting themselves if right. something comes up. Right. Okay. right. You know, they, they add that extra insurance if they cause the injury. Oftentimes in a scenario like that, everybody gets sued. The city gets sued. City staff gets sued. City officials get sued. And so we want as much coverage as we can get, and then we hopefully can protect everybody. Okay. All right, moving on. Uh, item O, discussion and necessary action regarding city park contracts. Um, as I was looking at it, we have multiple areas in the city where people can hold events. Um, and as the city grows with the different developments, we've got possibly a brewery coming in. There's going to be more sit more people wanting to have more events in these areas. Um, but as of right now, the only uh, property that requires any type of application or permit, I believe, is the pavilion. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, so what I would like the council to consider is just kind of extending that so that um, any public areas such as the, the park, um, the veterans park, the pavilion, they're all kind of covered the same way so that for booking reasons, so that they're not getting double booked, uh, just in case of whatever reason. I think it's just you know easy that we cover them all the same with the same type of application. How do you do that with the city park, though? I mean, can they rent out the whole city park? Really don't rent the park. It's, well, it's a public facility, but we do have rights to regulate its use. In other words. If somebody comes in and they want to put on a fireworks display or something, we can regulate uh, what they they do with our facility. And I know living down the street from it, some people hold their birthday parties there. So, you know, right now it's kind of a first come, first serve kind of deal. So hopefully, you know, not too many people are planning on it. But just uh, maybe for the future, it kind of makes it easier to book ahead so that you're guaranteed to have that spot. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not. It's not like we have tens and tens and tens. Yeah. You know, I'd I'd like to see us have more, right? More events, but just didn't want there to be a con you know, conflict. So just to fill out the paperwork in order to hold it on the calendar, and then once it's on the calendar, that's something that we as we put out things on our Facebook page, our city page, uh, our announcements, that kind of stuff, then we can help help advertise yeah. whatever that is if it's open to the public. And then also it allows it would allow staff uh, a, a better chance to gauge what what's going to be needed from the city, such as exactly. for parades we can 
staff with the police department for shutting down roads or escorts, uh, things like that. So I think if we just apply it to everything, it would better suit the city and make it easier on us. So do we need to make so, a motion? Well, we do have a parade permit, and we mm -hmm. also um, have a special event permit. And that require if you require city services, you're required to have that permit and pay for city services by the hour. Right. Okay. But if you're looking for more of a reservation type thing, staff can certainly look into it and propose an ordinance or a go by for residents to request the use of facilities, and then we can put stipulations on what they'd be required to supply. So w would it not be easier, Carvin, just to take what we're already doing for the pavilion and just say we're applying it to these other areas as well? Staff on that, but legally that's easy. Okay. Well, and wouldn't we want it to be a certain size of a group? Because just anybody having a party, I don't want to have you know ten yeah. people show up and yeah. Yeah. Why don't I have staff look into yeah. this? If you want to email me uh, okay. and let me know what you're thinking, and we'll look into it and make it happen. All right. Do we need to make any motion? No, that's just instructing the staff to take action. Okay. All right, moving on to item P, discussion and then any necessary action regarding Rome facilities, and this is Ms. Priest. Yeah, I just um, had a question, we, you know, it's been several weeks ago that we talked about getting bids for uh, our first priority facility, and that was the fire department. And so I was just wondering what kind of response we had, and I mean, we need to get moving on these things. Yes, ma'am. Um, I can tell you, I, I don't have that number tonight. Uh, okay. That's <laughs> been all right. a little busy doing some other things, but I will make a note of that and I will find out where we're at on that process. We did have um, the engineer or con contractor come in. He looked at all the facilities. He brought in his uh, expert electrician and the last I heard I my apologies I'm not up to date but uh, we were waiting for a final number from him okay. and you just reminded me that's one other thing we need to take care of okay so now we will uh, looks like we will conclude the open meeting and move into executive session uh, we will be going under section 551.071, consultation with the attorney for Aurora policing and production request. Also, section 551.072, deliberation regarding real property, and that is 0 East Morris Street. We will now convene into executive session at 8.38 p.m. This conference... All right, we are ending our executive session at 914 and reconvening into the regular open session. There is no action from executive session. Do we have any future agenda items? Some. Okay. If you come up with anything, please email them to city staff uh, the Wednesday prior to the next meeting. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion is adjourned. 915. <laughs>